Welcome back to Podcast Royal. I'm Jessica. And I'm Rachel. And Rachel, we're recording a little bit late this week, but we promised everyone that we would get an episode out. Um, I have been at the beach. I needed a little bit of relaxation and vacation time after the busy month I've had. And so I'm back now, happy to be recording with you. And you and I have kind of just missed each other in Birmingham because you came to town and I left and now I'm back and you're about to head out. Yeah, it's been, a, I think it's been a whirlwind week for both of us. I think yours has been more relaxed than mine, which I'm totally here for for you. I'm so happy for you. I'm, I'm going to get one of those soon, but um, it's just been, it's just been, February has been very, very busy. I'm looking forward to March being a bit calmer and I'm sure you would say the same. Yes. Um, yeah, I think things will, you know, they may calm down a little bit, but I don't know. I mean, if Royal News is any indication, uh, if things may just trend more and more busy. So we'll have to see. Yeah, I swear. I think that just when we're starting to get our footing, something else, and of course, listeners, you, I mean, we don't have to tell you there's been some really tragic news in the Royal world this week. Just when we, I feel like we may be starting to get our footing, the rug gets swept out from under us again. So we'll, of course, go over all of this, but it's good to be back with you again, albeit a day late. It's weird to be recording on a Wednesday, but I'm I'm a bit glad we did because if we'd recorded last night, we might not have had the full, not that we really even have the full picture now, but um, we have a deeper picture of what's going on in the royal family. So I'm I'm just glad to be here with you today and you too, listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Well, why don't we go ahead and jump into the Royal Rundown? Yeah, let's do it. So let's start with some semi-happy news. So the King shared such a sweet photo of him looking at cards sent from well-wishers, telling him to get well soon amidst his cancer diagnosis. So his majesty has received over 7,000 cards and letters, which is truly incredible. And he said that he has been reduced to tears. Those are his words over well-wishers, heartfelt love and support. That is what he told UK prime minister Rishi Sunak during their first face-to-face meeting since Charles's cancer diagnosis was revealed. The prime minister spoke for us all when he said, well, we're all behind you. The country's behind you to which I'd add the world is behind you, your majesty. So I will admit it certainly provided a sense of stability to see the king back at work again, although I still hope he is taking it easy. We all know he's a workaholic, so it did. It was good to see him again. I have to say that. You know, I think social content like this from the palace where they shared this reel of him receiving all of these get well soon cards. I know it's only a snippet of what the king is is up to and, and what he's doing. And, you know, we're not seeing a whole lot, but I think it really goes a long way in easing the minds of the public. You know, it, to me, it feels like it does a really great job at making sure people feel that he's doing okay and feel encouraged that he is still here with the country. He's making progress with his, with uh, his health journey. And, you know, I have to admit that I, when I I don't know, I know you saw this Rachel on the reel. I smiled when I saw the card of the little dog and it said, at least you don't have to wear a cone. And I thought it's kind of funny because when you think about it as King, Normally, he would wear a crown. And so if he can't wear his crown right now at work, at least he's not in a cone. Um, so I don't know. That that definitely made me smile. And I do. I truly hope and pray that he's feeling okay and, and he's regaining his health. Yeah, absolutely. And that goes for the Princess of Wales and the Duchess of York as well. And obviously, I was just talking to Jessica before we started recording that prior to Tuesday, the 27th, we really had such a light week of news. I mean, really hardly anything. Um, This, this story I'm about to share this lighthearted story was really like the top story of the week, but of course that's changed now. And a lot of the news (laughs) is is dark, but we're going to start on a lighthearted note. So it's going to be, um, it is a bit upsetting, right? Like said, said semi-sarcastically for those of us like me who enjoy looking at him, but Lieutenant Colonel Johnny Thompson, otherwise known as King Charles's hot equerry, quote unquote, 
um, has shifted into a new role out of the limelight after the world basically went nuts for him following the coronation. Um, Jessica, if you haven't already, we need to put a picture of him on Instagram simply because he's very, very handsome. (laughs) We can do that. (laughs) Yeah. But listeners, if you don't know the name Johnny Thompson, you're going to know the face of, of Johnny Thompson. So Johnny Thompson is a very, very good looking man. So the attention paid was well-deserved, but I also understand that this is just a man trying to do his job and not be made into a sex symbol. So the Times reports that he remains senior equity to the king and queen in a more executive and less public facing role and that he has understood, (laughs) this is so funny, not to have enjoyed the public attention he received after attending several high profile events with the king. So he was at the coronation, Prior to King Charles's reign, he also served as a bodyguard to Queen Elizabeth. He was right there at the king's side with that infamous pen incident. He handed the the pen to the king and like, so you will, listeners, you will recognize him. I personally will miss him. I dropped a photo of this beautiful creature on our show notes. And uh, I wonder if you'll miss him too a little bit. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so I, I have to wonder if he made this decision to transition into a new role after maybe hearing an episode of Podcast Royal bringing so much attention <laughs> he to was him. Like, That's it. I'm out. <laughs> I'm gone. We've talked before about him, but, oh, yeah. um, you know, all jokes aside, I, I do think it's interesting. You know, not everyone does enjoy being in the spotlight. It can be very uh, I don't know, anxiety inducing in a way. And, and there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. And I think even a lot of our royals probably on occasion wish that they could shift attention away from them. And I appreciate that the king was able to accommodate his requests and help him find a little bit different role <laughs> out of the limelight. And, you know, and and I get it. I will, I will say, Rachel, you know, when I was researching about this news story. I actually saw a tabloid photo of him. I think it was earlier this month and he was out in a completely personal capacity with, um, with his girlfriend. And, you know, it just made me think about the press and he knows what they're capable of when it comes to, Mm -hmm. you know, just putting stuff out there that you like, doesn't need to be there. You know, people in his personal life didn't sign up for that either. And so I think it's great for him to realize what's important to him and be able to adjust his life and his work to reflect that. So I, yeah, we'll miss him, but uh, he'll be around in in some way and, and I wish him well. Well, fun fact. So he sep- well, this is, this part is not fun, but he separated or divorced from his wife about two years ago. But the fun fact is that his girlfriend that you mentioned is a former public relations staffer for the King and Queen. So they met at the palace. So um, that's the second piece of devastating news is that he is uh, spoken for. So we will miss you. <laughs> we will miss you, Lieut- Lieutenant Colonel Thompson. So that's, that's lighthearted, but maybe we needed that in, in light of all that we're about to talk about. So why don't you get us into all of that? Yeah, let's let's shift a little bit. So listeners may remember King Constantine of Greece passed away in January of 2023. I think we reported about that on the podcast. It's been just over a year ago. And there was a memorial service planned for him for this past Tuesday of this week at St. George's Chapel in Windsor Castle. And we actually learned on Tuesday morning that the Prince of Wales, who was scheduled to be in attendance, I think he was even supposed to do a reading at the service, wouldn't be there due to personal matters. Now, Kensington Palace didn't elaborate on what the reason was, but I did see online, I know you did too, Rachel, it was confirmed by sources that the Princess of Wales is still recovering according to plan and she's doing well. Mm -hmm. So... Obviously, we don't exactly know why Prince William couldn't attend. They haven't shared that information. But I know there was a lot of chatter online as to why the palace chose not to disclose the reason and what the cause might have been. You know, did that cause even more chatter by by not saying anything? We could debate that. Um, and, and I think I actually was chatting with one of our followers on Instagram about this. Uh, you know, and, and so what I'll say is... Of course, there's no way to know without them sharing the details, but I do think we can all agree Prince William's been under a lot of stress the first quarter of this year. You know, when we look at the health conditions of some of his closest family members, he's had to pick up, uh, you know, a heavy workload and, uh, you know, both in his official royal duties and probably at home too. And so I'm, we're not going to speculate the reasons, but I just think we need to remember that and, um, 
it could have really been anything, honestly. It, it could have just had a been. cold or something. Who knows? He could have had a filling fallout, you know, I yeah. mean, like truly anything. Um, so I, I one thing that I do want to point out here is I want everybody to remember that I know the palace has recently started sharing more details about the family and they've been more open with the public on educating them on on things that are going on with the family. But this is still a relatively new thing that they're doing. They haven't always been this open. And so I imagine their team is still trying to learn where to draw the line between public versus private information and just balance what's appropriate to share, what information the public is owed versus what should be kept private for the family. And so, you know, I think they're still probably trying to figure that out. Yeah, I agree. Well, King Constantine of Greece was Prince William's godfather. So, you know, I don't think he would drop out of attending the services or wasn't if there wasn't a valid reason. So if there's any speculation about, you know, him just not going, I'm sure I'm sure the reason was valid. Um, of course, King Charles was also not in attendance as he continues his cancer treatments. Um, before I go into any more details about the event, Rachel, did was there anything that you read about this news or any commentary you had on that? Well, I think you said it really well. I think that everyone's first inclination was to think that it was about Kate. Kate's not doing well. How is Kate doing? And, you know, I think you and I were just, again, talking about this before we started recording that we've heard a lot in the last couple of days about, well, where's Kate? Where's Kate? Well, the palace said back in January, we were not going to see her until April, right? So it's, it's not yet March. So she, I don't think the two are connected. I, I, and I even think the palace confirmed that Kate is doing fine. So as you said, he could have had a filling fallout. He could have a cold. He could have the flu. He, a number of things. And I just think I, I, maybe, maybe the public is reacting this way because there has been so much bad news that they're, that we're just used to that now. And that's where our mind goes. But I truly think that William is okay and and things happen. I mean, we've all had to call out of work. We've had to miss things because of personal matters. And we're going to talk about this in a second, but I know a lot of people thought that William wasn't there yesterday because Tuesday because of the death in the family, which we'll get into in a minute. But um, as you're going to tell us in your reporting, that's not the case. That's not why he wasn't there. So I just think, you know, we have to, respect William's boundaries. If, if he wanted us to know, we would know. And Kate is fine. They've confirmed that. So, um, you know, he was missed yesterday. And like you said, I don't think he would have missed unless there was a good reason. So there has to be one. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we did see several other Royals at the service. So I want to chat about that for just a second with you, Rachel. We had Queen Camilla and I know I'm not going to name everybody here, but I'm going to list some of the names that we're more familiar with and the people that we talk about on the podcast. But we saw Queen Camilla, we saw Princess Anne and Timothy Lawrence, we saw Princess Beatrice and Edo, Zara and Mike Tyndall, Prince Andrew and Fergie were also there, and we saw the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester, the Prince and Princess Michael of Kent, the Duke of Kent, Princess Alexandra, and Lady Sarah Chato. I saw photos of all of them, and I have to say, Rachel, not sure if you saw the photos from the day, but Zara Tyndall looked absolutely beautiful. You know, I actually I, missed. I actually missed those photos. I should. I should go look at them. I um. I, oh, I've got them in our in our notes here for you to oh, take cool. a look at. But I noticed many of the royals at this event were in monochromatic looks, and we we see that a lot at this particular event. There were several in navy, and so Zara was no different in that regard. She kept with that navy kind of monochromatic look, but oh, she I just look thought beautiful. she. Wow. I thought she was dressed extremely well. She had this deep navy coat, pumps, a clutch, headband, gloves. Um, yeah, and I just I loved her outfit choice. Yeah, so. she looks fantastic. By the way, Andrew's appearance, of course, is generating a ton of controversy. And I, um, again, in, in light of the news that we've learned, I'm I'm a bit surprised that um, Prince and Princess Michael of Kent were there. But I I guess you know they maybe they felt like they needed to go so um we'll talk again we'll talk more about that in a minute but well, in addition beautiful. to our british royals there were of course many royals from greece and there were a few other familiar faces so we actually saw king philippe and queen Letitia of 
Spain, as well as the former king and queen of Spain at the service. And there were also some royals from Denmark, Jordan, and the Netherlands, although not our senior royals we usually report on. Um, many of the senior working royals did attend King Constantine's funeral last year, um, but they had other engagements they were at during this memorial service. However, from our Greek royals, a few that stood out to me when I was looking through photos online, I saw Queen Anne Marie, Princess Tatiana, Princess Theodora, Princess Nina, Princess Olympia, Princess Alexia, Crown Prince Pablos, and Crown Princess Marie Chantal. And I mentioned her last because I'm going to chat about her for a second. Like Zara Tyndall, I thought she was so impeccably dressed for this service. Now, she did stray from the dark navy trend, and she was in this beautiful burgundy dress, shawl, and pumps. And I just when I was scrolling through photos, I kept going back to her and Zara's outfits, and I just thought they both looked great. Yeah, they both look stunningly beautiful. I like both of those colors a lot, too. This episode is brought to you by Bumble. So you want to find someone you're compatible with, specifically someone who's ready for a serious connection, totally open to having kids in the future, is a tall, rock-climbing Libra, and loves rom-coms with vegan pizzas on Tuesdays just as much as you do. Bumble knows that you know exactly what's right for you. So whatever it is you're looking for, Bumble's features can help you find it. Date now on Bumble. Shortly after we learned about Prince William not being able to attend King Constantine of Greece's memorial service, we received some other terribly sad news from the British royal family that I know Rachel just kind of mentioned briefly a few minutes ago. Um, but it was the passing of Thomas Kingston. And if you're not familiar with that name, he was the son-in-law of Prince and Princess Michael of Kent. Um, Rachel, before we go further, this felt like, you know, we had we've had a few days this year where we got news from the royal family and it was kind of like back to back bad news. Um, yeah. And it sort of felt like this that day, like, you know, William not being able to attend. Well, you know, again, we don't know those reasons, but just the fact that, you know, it was already kind of a, a sad day, a memorial service. And then right after that, we got the news of Thomas Kingston. And um, I don't know, I was just really, really feeling for the family again when, when that happened. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was only 45 years old and in apparent good health to all that, you know, to at least to the public eye, I think to the family too. I think this, I mean, I think the word used was that this is a shock. And um, I think they were last publicly seen uh, Thomas Kingston and his wife, Lady Gabriella um, were seen on Valentine's day and he died, I believe on Sunday, the 25th of February. And he had just been married to Lady Gabriella for about five years. And it's just, I think the whole family is, is really reeling and, and listeners, you may know who this is. You may not. Yeah, let's say we're, I'll, I'll share a little context here. So Prince Michael of Kent is the first cousin of the late Queen Elizabeth II. So his daughter is Lady Gabriella, and she was the wife of Thomas Kingston. So what we've heard, what we know is that, as Rachel said, he was 45 years old. He passed away on Sunday. Um, Lady Gabriella and Thomas were engaged in 2018. They got married in 2019. They didn't have any children. Um, and I do want to mention that, you know, like you said earlier, Rachel, sources were confirming that Prince William's absence from the memorial service was not related to the passing of Thomas Kingston. And I do believe that is correct, given Prince and Princess Michael of Kent were at the service. Um, I, I sort of feel like they, you know, probably already committed to being to this service and that's why they were there. And so if they were there, I don't think that would be a reason for well, Prince. Yeah, Lee that's actually a really good point because if if Thomas Kingston's mother and father in law are there, then then why wouldn't William be there too? You know, yeah. if, so I think that's a good point. 
So a few other things that I wanted to note here that I, I found interesting. King Constantine of Greece was the godfather of both Prince William and Lady Gabriella. And prior to Thomas Kingston's relationship with Lady Gabriella, he actually dated Pippa Middleton. Mm -hmm. So I believe their relationship was over by 2011. But um, Thomas Pippa remained good friends and they actually attended each other's weddings. And um, so I, I just thought that was kind of, you know, fun to know and a little bit of um, just showing kind of that, that circle and how people are connected there. But um, Thomas well, it sounded so weird how all of these exes attend each other's weddings, but maybe that's just me that finds it weird. I don't know. I actually, actually, I like that. To me, it feels like um, they're able to end a relationship on mature yeah. good terms, I guess. Um, yeah. I don't know. I kind of like, I like that they're, yeah. uh, you know, no, no bad blood, I guess, you know? Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, well, Thomas attended Bristol University. He worked in finance as a CFA and director at Davenport Capital. And both he and Lady Gabriella, who often goes by Ella, they were actually close um, with King Charles and Queen Camilla. So if you didn't already follow the couple or you didn't know who they are prior to this episode, it is almost certain that you've seen photos of them at royal events and maybe you just didn't realize who they were. Yeah, and Lady Gabrielle was also a favorite of Queen Elizabeth's. And if you don't know who these two are, Thomas and Gabriella are by just their names, I guarantee you that you remember the queen at their wedding in 2019. She looked exuberantly happy. And that's because she really has such a fondness for Lady Gabriella. So um, just absolutely devastating. Mm. Well, the family did release a statement so I'll, I'll share that with listeners. It says, it is with deepest sorrow that we announce the death of Thomas Kingston, our beloved husband, son, and brother. Tom was an exceptional man who lit up the lives of all who knew him. His death has come as a great shock to the whole family, and we ask you to respect our privacy as we mourn his passing. Um, so, you know, we, we certainly do respect their privacy and it's just such a heartbreaking loss. Our thoughts and prayers are with Lady Gabriella and the rest of Thomas's family. Yeah, it's just absolutely devastating. I mean, I just remember their, their wedding was in April of 2019 and that's right around the time that I started my work as a Royal reporter. So I really remember, um, just again, how happy the late queen looked. I'm just really devastated for Lady Gabriella in particular about this. And of course, you know, the Duke and Duchess of, of Kent, just, just every, everyone in the Royal family. And I just want to mention that everyone had nothing but incredible things to say about him. He sounded like a truly, like a bright light and just horrible news. 45 is far, far too soon. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a slight turn this week to Harry. So Harry lost his legal challenge to have police security in the UK. That's just coming out today, Wednesday. Again, we're actually recording on Wednesday this week. And today, a high court judge, Peter Lane, upheld that decision by the UK government, specifically the Executive Committee for the Protection of Royalty and Public Figures, known as RAVIC. R -A -V -E -C. So Judge Lane ruled, quote, the court has found that there has not been any unlawfulness in reaching the decision of February 28th, 2020. The decision was not irrational. The decision was not marred by procedural unfairness. The court has also found that there has been no unlawfulness on the part of Ravik in respect of its arrangements for certain of the claimant's visits to Great Britain. So Harry does plan to appeal this decision and Actually, among the documents released today, Wednesday, related to the judgment, a letter from the New York City Police Department, NYPD, to the Metropolitan Police of London, which was dated on December 6th, 2023, said that, quote, this is, quote, unquote, reckless behavior by paparazzi was found in the May 16th, 2023 car chase in New York City involving Harry, Megan, and Megan's mother, Doria Raglan. I know a lot of people disputed that that chase ever happened, but these documents seem to show that it, that it did indeed happen. So um, there's some news on the Harry legal front. Last episode, he had a win. This time he had, a, a, I guess, a loss, perceived loss. And so he will be appealing that decision. So I believe that that wraps up our royal rundown. Just again, we just hammered with tough news. So prayers are sent all the way to the UK and the family. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, let's go ahead and jump into Royals Around the World. We've got a few updates this week. So we'll start with some news from our Swedish Royals. First up, happy birthday to Princess Estelle of Sweden. She Mm. turned 12 on February 23rd. Happy birthday, Princess Estelle. Well, last week we also mentioned that Crown Princess Victoria and Prince Daniel of Sweden had just begun an official visit to California, but you may remember since the trip was really in its early stages when we were recording, we held off on reporting until it had concluded so we could get a little bit of time to learn more about that trip and share it here. So I want to talk about that visit and man, I feel like I've had a lot of outfit changes going on in this visit, Rachel. I tried to put the photos in there, but it was a hard time keeping up. I appreciate that. (laughs) <laughs> so the royal couple kicked off their visit with what I believe is a must-do item. They posed for a photo in front of the Golden Gate Bridge. Mm-hmm. I mean, rain boots and all. They had <laughs> rain jackets on, and you could tell it was a little bit of a wet, dreary day. But after their touristy photo, they got right down to work. So if you're wondering what brought our Swedish royals to the USA, The purpose of this visit was to broaden and develop relations with California in innovation, green transition, and emerging technologies with a focus on artificial intelligence. Interesting. Very interesting. The first part of their trip included a stop at the Marine Mammal Center, where I thought we got some of the cutest photos of seals in something that we might normally call a wheelbarrow, but the organization has rebranded them to a seal barrow. (laughs) (laughs) That's great reporting right there. Don't you love that? (laughs) Yeah, that's pretty cute. That was an observation on my end when I was looking at those photos. So (laughs) later on, they arrived to the Scandinavian School and Cultural Center and the Church of Sweden in San Francisco. And there was a reception held that evening where the crown princess addressed Swedes living in the local area with a speech. And during her visit to the school, Victoria was in, and this is where I'm going to try to keep track of some of our outfits. I don't have IDs on all of these for this episode, but we'll chat about it a little bit. So she was in an ivory blouse that she had paired with a skirt by Max Jenny in their, I think it's one of like their Sicily pattern, Mm -hmm. um, looks very Italian to me. And she had bright red pumps on for that engagement. And then later on at the reception, I thought her evening outfit looked pretty similar, but I mean, it was a different look. Yeah, that's right. really well coordinated by her. Yeah, very well. So this time she was in a dress by Saloni and it was white with a floral pattern and she had the bright red pumps on again and the red clutch, but um, same kind of like a white, whitish background with these same sort of colors, but very well coordinated. You're right. Yeah, that's well transitioned from day to night. Well, then on the second day of the trip, the couple met the California governor and the mayor of San Francisco then later inaugurated Sweden's new consulate general general ooh, I can't say that consulate general as well as uh, attended engagements that were focused on technology like artificial intelligence. So during the day for these events, she was in a red pantsuit by the Extreme Collection, I think, and she had a red patterned neck scarf. And Rachel, I have to ask what you think about this look. Okay, there's two photos here, and listeners, obviously, you cannot see them, but the one on the right, Jessica, um, that I like. The, I like the pants. The colors look very starkly different, don't they? In like those two photos, is it like the shape? I think it's shape? the lighting, or yeah, yeah the light, like she's outside in one, inside in the other. But anyway, um, I love a good pantsuit. Obviously, you know, I I feel like it had been a bit overdone, at least in the British Royal family in, in the fall and into winter. But, um, I do, I do like this suit. The scarf is unique. Um, don't often see that, but I, I mean, I think she looks great. Victoria is one of my favorite Royals around the world to watch fashion wise. What do you think about it? Well, I think we are continuing to see a trend with pantsuits. Uh, there were some other photos of European royals on engagements this week, and I, I just saw a lot of pantsuits. Um, well, it's clear her outfits for this trip were trending, and we'll talk about the other ones in a minute, but red, green, and 
pink. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know yeah. where the pink came from, but but very red, green, and and then there was a pink element there. Um, Victoria, have you ever noticed? She almost always has her hair up in a bun. She does something always, that I never, I never see her with her hair down ever, rarely. Um, I I've said this on the podcast before. Red is not a personal favorite color of mine. The the bright red like that. I tend to like the more burgundy shades and. I may be on my own here, but I'm not a big fan of the neck scarves. Um, I'm not either. I'm not either. It looks, it, it honestly it reminds me a bit of a flight attendant, to be honest with you. That's the first thing that I thought of when I saw it. You know how there are some elements of fashion that feel like they cut you off in the wrong places? That's mm-hmm. what, that's what I get with a neck scarf. Like, I just feel like it kind of cuts you off and you don't get this continuation um, uh-huh. from, from head uh-huh. to foot, but Oh, anyway, so that those were my thoughts about that look. Yeah, the pantsuit is fine. I'm I am a bit distracted by the neck scarf. I maybe she's trying to do the through line of patterns from because obviously you know the floral pattern from the day before. But um, I think this look could have been just fine without that neck scarf. All right. So for the reception um, for the Consulate General of Sweden, she wore a full-length one-shoulder dress by Melina, and it was in this rich, dark green color, and it had a lavender floral pattern at the top. And so one was like no shoulder, no sleeve. One was shoulder with a long sleeve, and she matched her purse and her shoes and her shawl to the lavender color in the dress. So a little bit different look from the day before and earlier that day. Do you think this was a win, Rachel? I do not, as a matter of fact. Oh, I'm surprised. I thought you were going to say Well, it's too busy at the top. Like, it's two different dresses like meshed into one if it had just if the one shoulder I have no problem with that the green is a beautiful green color I wish it would have just been a solid green color maybe I'm boring and I just don't gravitate towards patterns but you as I just said even before looking at this photo of Victoria obviously patterns are kind of the through line through her outfit had she gone had the dress the one again the one shoulder is fine with me had she gone with just the the solid green or the pattern I think I would have liked both of those right mm-hmm. but the mm-hmm. fact that it's both the pattern and the solid I don't like that it's too busy for me it okay. cuts off at a weird place like right below her her bosom and I just don't I I don't know what do you think So I'm actually okay with the pattern um, and the two colors together. That doesn't bother me. Um, It's not my favorite look because I don't love the cut of the dress. Um, It's, it's, it appears wrinkled in the photo um, and that may be the material, but it's Mm -hmm. very, very straight. There's not a lot of wiggle room there. And um, I just don't love the overall cut, Uh, but the, but the floral pattern didn't really bother me. I actually love the sleeve on the long sleeve, the way that the sleeve is structured. I think that's actually really cool. Again, I would have loved, I think I would have loved this dress had it just been the solid color or had it been the pattern, but both of them is distracting to me and it just looks very busy to me. Yeah. Well, at the end of the week, they visited Palo Alto, California, where they actually, this is like kind of cool. They met with big companies like Google and NVIDIA and, um, so for this engagement, Crown Princess Victoria was in, again, same same kind of shade of green. It was an emerald green pantsuit, and this one is by Zara, and she had another necktie. So we've got another tie in here to her look, mm-hmm. um, and before we move on, thoughts on this? Same story as the red pantsuit. I mean, it's yeah. almost it looks almost identical to the red pantsuit. I was going to say, I agree. I mean, she's keeping with the uniformity here. Yeah. I just could do without the neck scarf. I mean, it just, it just takes away from, from the honestly great cut of this suit. I love the way that the pants are cut and uh, it's a great suit. Well, they also paid a visit to Stanford University for more content focused on AI. And for this event, she was in like a bubblegum pink pantsuit. It was also from Zara, a little bit different look and color mm-hmm. from the other days. Um, kind of, I don't know, actually kind of stands out a little bit more. Any thoughts on this one? Well, this color reminds me of a Kate pantsuit from 2023. I think she wore nearly the same color. Um, yep. Barbie core is on its way out. And, but I mean, I still love the color pink that Barbie core or not. 
Um, I like the cut of the pants, the green pantsuit much, much more than I like the cut of, of this pantsuit. I love the way really? the pants cut in the green pantsuit. I, I don't really, the color is fine with me. I don't really like the lapels on this and I don't really like the flare. It's a little bit different. So I, I get it trying to shake it up, but um, I prefer the green, the green pantsuit the best, like the cut of it anyway. Well, I've really been finding myself buying more pink lately. I've always liked mm-hmm. pink, but yeah, I've been buying more lately. Great. So I actually, this is my favorite pantsuit of the week. Um, mm-hmm. I loved it. I thought the color was really fun. I thought it was actually very flattering to her skin tone. It is. Um, yeah. And she ditched the next scarf, Rachel. So she took she your did. your point there. Uh, and I, I don't know. I like this one a lot better. It was my favorite pantsuit. And I'm wondering if she, and this is me just kind of going out on a limb here, but does this pink color, was this an effort by her stylist to tie back into that green and lavender dress from the day before, maybe? Maybe. Uh, otherwise, I don't know where the pink came from, but um, I, do I don't like know. I like color. this one. I like the color. Um, you're right. I mean, obviously, there's a stylist with a very seamless through line that she's trying to weave. I think, you know what? The pants grow on me the more I look at them. I think it's the pockets on the blazer that are that are wigging me out a little bit. I just, they're, they're distracting me, but um, yeah, the color's great. Well, that concluded their trip to California. And I just find it really interesting that our Swedish Royals are meeting with tech experts in California. And mm-hmm. I just, I don't know, Rachel, I'm kind of wondering what we're going to see come of this in the future. Yeah, I know. I, I, you know, listeners, it's not a secret that Sweden is one of our favorite Royal families. We love crown princess Victoria and, um, I think that they're really like this royal family is really innovative and on the cusp and I'm excited to see what's to come for them. And I love having any royal in America. So bring it on. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and chat about another family. So we've got some news out of Norway. Um, Another kind of a bad story to share. So first of all, King Harold turned 87 years old on February 21st. So first up, happy birthday, to King Harold. Yes. Happy birthday. Okay. So let's pivot from the celebratory news. We found out this week that the King was recently hospital uh, hospitalized while on vacation in Malaysia. So since this was a personal trip, he was taking, he was on vacation. It wasn't an official visit. I'm kind of going out on a limb here. I I really, I keep feel like I've said that a lot this episode. I'm going out on a lot of limbs, but (laughs) I'm assuming maybe this was like a little birthday vacation because he just had Mm -hmm. a birthday over a week ago. But ahead of his birthday, the palace had shared the news that he would be taking a private trip abroad. They didn't give us any information on the location or the dates of his travel. So he was expected to be away. Well, now because of this news, we know he's been in Malaysia And it's being reported that while he was there, he was hospitalized due to an infection. So he is being tended to by both Malaysian and Norwegian healthcare providers. We don't know the cause of the infection. We do know that he's had several health concerns in recent months and years, and that includes a heart valve replacement in 2020. And he actually was just getting over a respiratory infection a few weeks ago that had put him on sick leave. So, you know, he's he's in Malaysia in the hospital right now. And while he's unable to work, Crown Prince Hakan has stepped in on his behalf to lead royal duties in Norway and um, really re- wish King Harold a speedy recovery. He is actually currently the oldest monarch in Europe. And, you know, Rachel, I find it really surprising that at 87, he did such an extensive trek abroad mm-hmm. on the heels of a respiratory infection that had kind of already had him out of work. Um, so I, you know, I hate to hear that he's come down with something. Yeah. And I, I, I've actually never thought about what happens if a monarch gets, becomes ill while abroad. And I guess, you know, they've got doctors from Malaysia, but also from Norway treating, I mean, he's going to get the best care possible, but, um, 87 is, is not young. And so I, you know, I, I get worried anytime I saw this headline come across and I get worried anytime that, um, that I hear that I hear news like this, but I know he's getting the best treatment possible. And, you know, as I feel like we've gotten Jessica really used to saying around here, we wish him the best, you know, wish him a speedy recovery and 
send our well wishes. It's really kind of scary. Yeah, definitely. And and I don't know when he travels in a personal capacity, if he travels with, you know, a, a team or any sort of medical staff, or if they go over to, you know, you were asking about what happens. I don't know if they fly over once they get the news, but, yeah. um, but I'm glad to hear he's got people there taking care of him and keeping a close eye on him. So mm-hmm. just hope he's back home in Norway um, and fully recovered very soon. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm going to wrap up this segment with just a few more engagements from this past week that I want to note. So King Philippe and Queen Mathilde of Belgium traveled to the Netherlands this week for an engagement with Europol. And if you're not familiar, Europol is an organization that helps European nations prevent and combat crime, cyber crime, and terrorism. So other threats that they're focused on include fraud, drug trafficking, and human trafficking. And the king and queen were there to learn about the organization and all the work that they're doing. So interesting engagement there. Lots of interesting engagements around the world this week. Yes. And another interesting fact, while the king and queen of Belgium were in the Netherlands, the queen of the Netherlands flew to Colombia for a four-day visit of financial engagement. So Queen Maxima works with the United Nations for financial health and inclusion, and she's actually in a role. So she's the United Nations Secretary General's Special Counsel for Inclusive Finance for Development. I think I got that right. It's quite a long title, but Mm -hmm. (laughs) her visit is centered on financial health in Colombia and specifically supporting groups in need like rural farmers, small businesses, low income individuals, and women. So really cool work that she's got going on. Yeah. And then lastly, Queen Mary of Denmark attended her first engagement of 2024 at the Elite Research Awards in Copenhagen. So the awards are presented to those who lead work in research. And this year she presented awards to five recipients. And Rachel, we're going back to fashion here for a second because something I found really interesting about her look for this event, she was in a pretty standard navy pantsuit like we've been talking about. She had snakeskin pumps on, but the interesting thing is her fingernails were painted a very bold, opaque Mm -hmm. blue color, and it was totally unexpected, not something that we typically see on a working royal, much less a queen, and I have to know your thoughts on the blue nail polish. That is a bold shade of blue. Like, that is <laughs> that is bold. So I'm super boring with my nails. I always have my nails done, but they're always pink or, gr- or pink or green. Shoot, pink or red. They're, I never have in my life worn green nail polish. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but I'm really boring with my nail polish. I, I'm always in the pink or the red family. And same with my pedicure, but this is a very, very bold. I like the color on her. I, I, it's just not something I would personally do because I'm boring, but like on her, I mean, snakeskin and those blue nails, that is bold. And for, and it would be bold if she were still crown princess. Now that she's queen, I, I kind of love it. Like I, I love a little bit of a daring twist. Her suit is Navy. Her nails are not Navy. They're, they're, I don't even know what to call that color. Like a cerulean, maybe like it's Mm -hmm. very bold blue and I kind of like it I would not personally probably wear that color but again I'm boring um Mary is with this outfit anyway anything but boring what do you think about this this is pretty bold yeah I mean it definitely shows us some of her personality Mm -hmm. which is fun um I do agree it is quite different and bold for someone in the role of queen I don't have a problem with it um but I just, it was just surprising to me. I yeah. agree with you. I, so I went, I went through a phase. I feel like where I had my nails painted darker colors a lot, like the, the deep reds or the blues or mm-hmm. even, you know, black on occasion. Um, and lately I've been trending more towards some of the neutrals and the lighter, more like translucent colors. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is fun. I mean, it's different. Yeah. So I, I, I think it. it's cool. And let's remember that, you know, not everybody, even in the British royal family now, not everybody has to follow Queen Elizabeth's protocol. It definitely not in the, uh, in royal families from around the world. So she can do what <laughs> she wants. And if she wants to paint her nails cerulean blue, then by golly, she'll do it. So I, I, I'm into it. I'm into that bold pop of color. It's interesting. Definitely keeps definitely. people like us talking and, and entertained. So 
Well, and I like, I like that she feels the freedom to do that too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, shall we move into part two of this series on the firm? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so this is the very last of the Royal Potpourri series, and it's if you'll remember from last week, listeners, it's a three-part series on the firm. This is part two. So this week is going to continue our education on the firm. Last week, we talked about the Royal Collection, but I didn't really talk about what the Royal Collection is itself. It is the largest private art collection in the world. It is spread across 13 royal residences in the UK. It is made up of 1 million objects, including 7,000 paintings, over 150,000 works on paper, including 30,000 watercolors and drawings, about 450,000 photographs, and around 700,000 works of art, including furniture, ceramics, textiles, carriages, weapons, armor, jewelry, clocks, musical instruments, tableware, plants, I'm still going, manuscripts, books, and sculptures. So some buildings that house the Royal Collection, like Hampton Court Palace, are not lived in by royals, but some, like Windsor Castle and Kensington Palace, are royal residences. I don't think anybody's living in Windsor right now, but you get the point. Switching gears here for a minute, the topic of royals and money is complicated, but today I want to talk about the Sovereign Grant, which supports the monarch's official business. It meets the central staff costs and expenses of His Majesty's official household, including official receptions, investitures, and garden parties. The Sovereign Grant is a taxpayer-funded settlement that is paid annually, but it isn't the king's or the royal family's only source of income. So think the Duchy of Lancaster for the king, the Duchy of Cornwall for the Duke of Cornwall, a.k.a. William. We just talked about that, Jessica. Last week, you talked about that with the Homewards Initiative, the Duchy of Cornwall. So for 2022-2023, the sovereign grant was worth 86.3 million pounds, which is the same as 2021 to 2022. The sovereign grant grant replaced the civil list, which is a fixed annual payment in 2012. And under the Sovereign Grant Act 2011, if the Crown Estates profits fall, the, I think this is interesting. We have talked about this on the show before. I know the monarch will still receive the same amount as the previous year. The government has to make up the difference, which is actually like a really good provision to look out for the royal family. So the Sovereign Grant Act was the biggest reform to the finances of the British royal family since the civil list began in 1760. I've got to tell you, talking about royals and money is super complicated, but I think knowing what the Sovereign Grant is, is a key sto- a key cornerstone to start with. So finally, we're all over the place with this series, but that's on purpose because we're talking about things that we would never probably devote a full segment to, but are still things that are important to know. So finally for this week, the Commonwealth. So the Commonwealth's full name is the Commonwealth of Nations. This is an internet. I know we've talked about the Commonwealth 7,000 times on this show, but this is an international association of 56 member states founded in 1931. The vast majority are countries that were once part of the British empire. King Charles oversees the Commonwealth. There are 15 Commonwealth realms. And the rest of the countries are republics. So the Commonwealth actually has a foundation. There are the Commonwealth Games, much like the Olympics. There's Commonwealth Day. Commonwealth even has an anthem of its own. So just a reminder, the Commonwealth realms, those 15 Commonwealth realms, which is where Charles is considered king, are Antigua and Barbuda, Australia, Bahamas, Belize, Canada, Grenada, Jamaica, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Solomon Islands, Tuvalu, and of course, the United Kingdom. And uh, these, by the way, this, this, uh, the firm series is the opposite of a deep dive. This is what I'm calling shallow swims, if you will. So did you learn anything in that brief overview? Yes, Rachel, I always learn so much when you uh, tell us these little bits and, you know, it's, we report on the Royals and we've been doing this for, gosh, how many years are we at now? (laughs) Fourth, fourth year. Yeah. And so sometimes it feels like we've kind of read it all, but there's again, you know, always something to be surprised by something more to learn. And so I know some of our listeners learned something new today too. So thank you for continuing this little 
series. It's been really fun. Absolutely. And listeners, if there's something on this that you're like, I want to know more about, then you can write in and you can be in listener Q&A. So if you still have more questions, ask us and we will do a listener Q&A about it. Yes, definitely. We love doing listener questions. So send it in and um, let us know if there's anything we talked about today that you want to share your thoughts on. We'd love to hear. Um, we have a lot of fun chatting with with all of our followers over on Instagram. And um, it's great to be back this week with you, Rachel. You um, I, think, I think that does it for us this episode. That'll do it. Well, as always, be sure to come hang out with us on Instagram at Podcast Royal. If you have questions or thoughts, you can send us a DM on Instagram, or you can actually send us an email at hellopodcastroyal at gmail.com. And as always, please rate and review this show over on Apple Podcasts. We always appreciate a five-star review. And thank you so much for tuning into episode 128 of Podcast Royal. Bye. Bye. Thank you.